thank you everyone for coming here tonight. Um, it's with an enormous pleasure that I'm able to welcome our three guests. Um, Sarah Raza has joined us from New York, so we're absolutely delighted that she's come here all this way to be here tonight. Um, she's here in conversation with Ekaterina Gagesian and uh, Katie Deepwell. Now, when we suggested, in fact, it was, it was Omid here who suggested bringing Sarah over, uh, because this is a particularly opportune moment to begin to talk about the nature of upheaval, its relationship particularly to feminist public space and time. Now, of course, this is a very a difficult moment. The last year has been particularly uh, one of tremendous upheaval. And I think that having the book to launch tonight is a really wonderful moment to begin to reflect on the mode of rebellion, um, the way in which we describe a set of ideas, and to challenge the kind of the, 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 kind of the linear representation of the way in which we talk about history, the way in which we talk about culture, the way in which we talk about ourselves. I think the way in which the book is framed and the way in which you uh, bring authors together and artists together has its own revolutionary character. Um, but I think it's particularly apt, particularly at a moment when we're talking about the decolonization of curricula, the way in which we describe histories. I think it's also an important point because it addresses the way in which we deal with tipping points. Over the past year, there's been a number of tremendous tipping points that have taken moments of tremendous personal and collective bravery to take action in different ways in different parts of the world. But fundamentally, these do so at tremendous personal risk and with a kind of um, perhaps a lack of clarity of what an ultimate outcome may be. This is an interesting parallel, not just for the mode of rebellion, but for the way in which we conduct our education. The level of kind of personal risk and the risks that we take through our work and through the way in which we have a conversation, I hope is embedded in what we can talk about this evening. There are two or three things that I think were extraordinary in the past, I suppose, 10 years. Um, when I was teaching here, it was the beginning of the Arab Spring, and I remember coming back from the US on a plane, and there was a woman behind me that can't have been more than 18, and she just left, I think, DC. She'd spoken to Congress, she'd just come back from Harvard to talk about new modes of democracy, and this incredibly young person full of hope. Many years later, I had a student who took part in the um, umbrella movement in Hong Kong and described feeling that one had to do something even if there was really no particular hope of enacting change or winning. And I think that the third thing, I was very, very fortunate to attend a, an event with the late David Graeber on revolution in Rojava, which again was this idea of a new structure of hope, hope that doesn't necessarily come from an ordered kind of thinking, and I think, or an ordered form of representation. So I think tonight is a fantastic opportunity to welcome the three of you and to begin to this discussion around what is an extraordinary book. Please, please uh, have a look, buy it. <laughs> and um, and um, go over to you. And uh, thank you so much for coming. between the three of us. Um, okay, so my name is Katie Deepwell, and uh, I was very pleased when Sarah asked me to come and chair this event. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I was very pleased when Sarah asked me to come and chair this event because I went to a previous book launch of hers at the South London Gallery, and I was very interested in the way that her book tries to collide two different concepts. Punk, which everybody in Britain has a very peculiar idea of what punk is and punk rock, with Orientalism, which uh, is well known through Edward Said's book, Orientalism, which is um, another Western gaze on the Near East, or close East, um, a construction of knowledge. So we have two different realities colliding together to explore post-Soviet space and also um, space in a decolonized um, 
environment which has been heavily decolonized from its history of Russia. So I think it's quite peculiar as a kind of concept to put these two things together. And I hope that by the end of the evening, the logics between these two or the relationship between these two ideas, the collage or montage of these two concepts will come together and uh, you will have some idea of the arguments within the book. Um, one of the things that impressed me most when we were talking about this was Sarah said to me, the artists come first. I'm thinking about the artists and the dialogue with the artists. So we're going to begin what isn't really a lecture, but it's more a series of interruptions <laughs> or kind of conversations as we go through. So we're going to begin with Sarah talking to Ekaterina about her work, which is the start of a lecture. And then Sarah will go on to talk about other artists. And Ekaterina and myself will interrupt with comments and questions each phase of these kind of chapter in a lecture. So uh, we're hoping that that will work as a formula. So if you have any questions, as I'm the chair, you can raise your hand and I will invite you into the conversation. So if you want to make yourself known and you have some burning issue, we are happy to accommodate you. Okay. And um, the, other, the other thing that I want to say is I'm half tempted to read out the wonderful list of tributes and fantastic achievements um, that was on the website, but I think I really want just to direct you back to the website. I don't really want to take up more of this evening with uh, reading out a list of credits. Okay, so Sarah, can you begin by talking about our Katerina's work and also the first concept of punk orientalism? Sure, of course. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you all for being here. I'd just like to uh, extend my gratitude to Ingrid, to Omid and Menager for inviting us to be here this evening. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you all. I actually gave a lecture here earlier this afternoon to uh, the students, and some of them are here again this uh, evening, so I hope I don't bore you by <laughs> speaking about some of the themes again. But uh, as, um, as Katie gave a wonderful introduction today, I'll be speaking about one of the most central themes within this uh, project of mine, which is punk orientalism. 17 years of curatorial practice have sort of gone into this uh, a uh, project which is uh, a bricolage of thinking about non-conformity, which is the punk. My education was at Goldsmith College and Royal College of Art, which was sort of the birthplace of the YBA artists, and they were very much punk inspired the next wave of generation artists that had this uh, spirit of DIY, but had this sort of rebellious streak where you could have two or more ideas that could coexist. Uh, simultaneously. So for me, this was sort of an opportunity to sort of reframe or rethink what Edward Said defined as Orientalism and sort of uh, attach that to this punk idea. So this uh, concept of bricolage to bring disparate ideas together to create something new. Edward Said is probably the most influential scholar uh, for myself and the work that I do looking at the post-colonial space and the post-Soviet space in tandem. However, despite his brilliance as a public intellectual, he completely missed something called the second space or the second world. And something that I've always struggled with within my own research is thinking about East-East binaries rather than East-West dialectics. And this is something sort of really uh, inherent within the work of the formation of the USSR because it was an Eastern form of Orientalism. It wasn't this sort of separation of East and West, this sort of colonial concept. It was a little bit uh, similar in a sense that it was about the Eurasian region. And you know, prior to that, there have been other examples such as the Ottoman Empire, which was a Muslim imperialism and so forth. So this for me was sort of the main sort of point that I wanted to subvert. And as Katie mentioned, I've been very much interested in the artist-driven lens. Although I'm an art historian and a curator, my work, I would argue, is artist-led. So I have an art historical practice that is derived from the artist's perspective. And coming from an art school environment that's sort of been really inherent from that education at Goldsmiths, from that education at Royal College of Art, to sort of center the artist at the core of the discussion. And uh, with this text, I'm sort of really delighted that I brought together 31 
artist practitioners who I've had the pleasure of working with over 17 years, and they appear at various junctures of the book. So the book is thematically organized. It looks at themes such as recreation, both within space, but also uh, on the terrestrial sort of scale. It explores whistleblowing architecture, both in its informal and formal capacities, as well as sort of ideas around landscaping and proxies also. So it's got a very thematic strand. Uh, however, uh, the artists are really the motivating force. So there's a story to be told here that sort of starts in the 19th century great game and sort of moves forward into the 20th and 21st century. So there's this sort of zigzagging of time and space sort of going back and forth. And something that Ingrid also mentioned that the text defies this very vertical understanding of art history, which is sort of inherent within the way uh, the art historical canon is developed within the uh, Western context. I'm sort of looking at something that isn't, wasn't always uh, able to be this sort of vertical chronological sort of history. It was also uh, horizontal, it was also uh, diagonal, it was also rhizomatic in a sense that there were many, many interruptions, whether they were ruptures, revolutions, conflicts, it sort of took many different forms. So the work that I've sort of tried to encapsulate in the artists that I reflect upon, particularly although from the USSR and its neighboring regions in the Middle East, really historically is sandwiched somewhere between 1979 and uh, 2001. So loosely, it looks at the period of revolution in Iran, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the incident of Mecca, which is a lesser known incident in which a group of insurgents stormed uh, the holy city of Mecca, and how these sort of really main events in that cross between Central Asia, West Asia, which is also the Middle East, how they sort of defined an entire generation, how they created such chasms or rather interruptions in that region. Then I look at another decade, 89, sort of a very pivotal moment when the worlds sort of reorganized themselves. It was the end of apartheid. It was the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was the end of the Iran-Iraq War. And it was the end of the Soviet-Afghan War. The world was sort of changing again. And then we had, so obviously, the decline the, of the Soviet Union in 1991, and what then became the multicultural decade of the 90s, when people were moving in a way that they hadn't been able to do so before. And then the internet, sort of revolution in technology, and all of that sort of uh, progress was sort of regressed when 9-11 happened, how there was a sort of uh, stoppage, or sort of another form of interruption, rather, that really changed the course of the history again. And in between, there have been various sort of iterations of what I call the re-emergence of the great game, which started in the 19th century with Great Britain, Russia, with Afghanistan in the middle, and how that role keeps reprising itself within our current moment. And all of this sort of intersects and cuts between a local, global, and digital history. And for me, the hand of the artist is sort of the critical tool in this book, not only for repair, but also as an example for what we might call repatriation. How we look to artists to find creative solutions of what could constitute as another reality. And that's sort of really important for the work that I'm doing as a curator. And I think and also the great fortune that I've had of working with artists who've helped me sort of think through this history, think through these sort of uh, geographies as this part of this fragmented, highly complex jigsaw puzzle that sort of comes together, that the parts are a little bit jagged, they're not always smooth, but the, somehow it comes, uh, it sort of sits. Let's say whether it's capable of holding in its current state, but it definitely at the present sits together in an unusual way. So I'm very grateful that I have Ai Cacciarini here as one of the artists who's been working with me for the last decade. Also, both I've been writing about her, I've been curating her work who has been sort of highly influential for me in rethinking public space, as well as its sort of uh, temporal qualities, thinking about punk, thinking about art, and how it sort of sits within all what I just described. Hello, Sarah. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to start by talking about 
one of the of one of my works that Sarah included Sarah in the punk orientalism book, book, which is also, also all, which is okay, which, which is, is also okay. which my. Is also First my collage work. First collage my work. It's, from my 2011, it's from 2011, so it's more than a decade, so now. Than a decade now. And although and it's although um, it's, it's my first collage work, and this is for those that don't know my practice, is a really seminal a moment really seminal for me moment because up until that moment I was only making first-person first uh, films, uh, uh, films, which dealt uh, with the idea of the diaspora because I am a mixed heritage. Greek Armenian uh, diasporic, uh, diasporic uh, subject, uh, let's say, subject, and say. I, I, yeah, and this was yeah. the, first was the first time when, when I, was working I was working on in Soviet. In well, I was Soviet I was working well, in Armenia was, working for my PhD, researching my PhD, my PhD and, and PhD, as I was trying to make a film, the, film uh, which, uh, which I've which made subsequently I've called made My Pink City, which was an attempt to. Create a portrait of Yerevan as a post Soviet space, but also it was an attempt to understand how Yerevan in the post Soviet reality could become a place of belonging for the for a, a, a diverse Armenian diaspora. How a city that was very clearly uh, Soviet in its architectural Soviet style architectural could style, have this kind of um, this moment kind of, of, um, moment of could, um, could be a, 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 a point a, where many different where many uh, subjectivities, subjectivities collide. So collide. for this, so as I was this, making this film, I was, I was first, film, firstly, was first f for the first time, the encounter first time Soviet encounter Armenian Soviet Armenian visual Armenian culture, visual and culture. this work this also. Work uh, it's a historical uh, work in a sense, a because, in a sense it because it captures a moment when the, when the uh, there was, uh, there which was has changed now which because, has of, changed the now because Ukraine, of the war in Ukraine, where the where cultural the dialogues cultural dialogues thought as be thought I thought as be that finally thought could that become could possible, possible or they were possible. They were so possible. the work in a sense, so the work in a sense it's based on it's Soviet based on Armenian. Soviet uh, photographic uh, albums, photographic which, albums are documentary which are albums, documentary but also we can albums, say, we can, we can say describe them as coffee table books, coffee table books and, and elements which I photographed which from, I photographed the, from the, the then, uh, 2011, uh, 2011, urban space of Yerevan. Space of these, Yerevan. Elements these elements have, have the, for me, so for the me, elements that you see so collage, they are my photographs, which then, photographs, then I, of the decorative elements, the, the public space, which I then um, uh, cut out and collage on, on the archival images. Uh, these elements, these decorative these elements, elements for me in the, la in the last of, the of, the of, of the landscape, of the urban landscape, where where traces represent for me the traces of a cultural dialogue because they are in a diverse in their context cultural reference context so you have elements of the soviet modernity you have elements of vernacular national armenian uh, architecture or design, architecture or and design. you have elements and of the new of urban, the new neon, urban capitalist, neon, capitalist, neoliberal capitalist reality. reality. So, the, in this so first, the, um, first um, uh, collage series, uh, I was trying to make trying visible to make this, transition visible, this transition or into a post-Soviet post reality. reality. And what I and see now, in retrospect, see now in retrospect <laughs> working with, uh, working with, with Sarah and coming back to the work as a I see that there is a strong, a strong environmental element in the practice, in the practice which I was not aware was while not I was aware making it. I was not aware, I mean, not I, aware, I, I, I move from, I, from I the move city from to, from the, to city the rural the reality rural or to the mountains, the and there is a kind of a strong, a strong sense of, of, uh, of uh, how the uh, landscape how comes the landscape uh, re... re, re Becomes constructed, constructed in a sense. Okay. Uh, yes, which I was not, uh, yes, so, I was not so clear, clear. 12 years ago. 12 about years that. ago. There's a about that. oscillation here. So you're going to obviously between this uh, um, cosmopolitan space, with polis is sort of really rooted in the urban space, but also the rural areas, the mountainous region. These architectural sort of elements that you overlaid upon the images, these also sourced also roughly sourced. the same time period, these were also 80s, 
1970. These are my, from my These own photographs my, my own of Yerevan at that time. So, for so example, you for have example, the playground. Have the playground. I was, I'm very, I was I'm very, in general, I'm very, general, I'm very um, um, attracted um, to playgrounds, or they're, they're very kitsch in their appearance, but I have a have soft a spot for them. Spot so, for them. there are playgrounds, so there are, playgrounds, I think, the bean. Yeah. It's, a it's a baby, a baby also contemporary of the time, contemporary but, there time beans, but there are other beans which beans in the in the series which are very clearly series, Soviet very clearly modernist Soviet architecture, architecture uh, uh, design, uh, design. design and I think there is a kind of I also a sense of rememorializing re the, 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 the space because there was a sense of you know these are remnants of a culture that has passed and somehow I wanted to kind of rememorialize it uh, uh, by making uh, very by clear, making very clear and, and very visible the cultural dialogues, the crisscrossing of cultures. Can I just say that when, when we were talking before, when we were talking before, we were talking uh, one of before, the uh, things that uh, we things talked about a lot was, was this lot. collision of this two, different two different realities. And this is very clear this in your clear collages. In but but um, um, I, I decided to go I, away and read a book, read you know, book, preparation. So I read this very interesting so book by Elizabeth Grosch where Elizabeth she talks about, um, she talks time. about um, time. And she talks about the way in which the, way in the which um, present time always contains time echoes, always of the past. echoes of the past. And, you know, we feel that anyway as we, we walk around a city. We, we see architecture from different eras all the time. We see small details all the time. We live with the past. But... Um, one of the things um, that impressed me in our conversation was you said that you wanted to tell new narratives. You wanted to tell new stories about the collision of these relationships because you had picked out very small details which seemed indistinct and put them on larger realities. Yeah. I, I'm, I, temporality, I, I, like the, the issue of time is really important in my work. So the going back into the past is always related to related to to the future somehow, the future this somehow. kind of new, na new narratives. Kind of new so narratives. the future is so really the future important is really in, in, the, in the practice. I think it, it still comes from, still comes from, from um, um, questions, the, questions the, possibility the possibility of, of new... <coughs> new uh, of new ways of, of being, new ways of being. Uh, it has it has an uh, utopic has, element, an and element. I also and wanted to respect also that to respect in that in terms in of in terms the production of the, production of the Soviet, of visual the material Soviet visual material to begin with, because they had, with, because uh, they had uh, when they were produced, there was a the kind of a uh, moment, uh, moment of let's say po of let's utopic say potential. And um, so, um, whenever, so I whenever I collage or, collage or work, collage with, found work with found material, I try to respect, I try to respect uh, the, uh, the what I call the documentary, the documentary reality, reality of the material. Of so the I try material. to so I try allow for the histories to become to, 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 to always be present, uh, the, di the, the, uh, the, the di diverse histories, diverse and. Um, the future, I think, it will come back again in the next work, <laughs> which <laughs> is something that I, something I, started, I, st I started, well, it's always present in well, the work, in the as, work as, as a trial to create new trial, forms of imagination, forms or, of imagination or, or new narratives, or new ways of being, ways to allow for this possibility. But at the current moment, well, maybe this idea that the future is possible is also possible something is that, also something especially post-COVID, is something that I'm thinking that, that I, 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 I might have started thinking differently. Absolutely, and it's very interesting you mentioned the future because so one of the sort of proclamations was no future. And that was the whole idea of tearing everything down to sort of rethink what could happen in the present. And uh, although that was a very Euro, sort of American-centric, nihilist sort of concept, in the artists that we're looking at, there's this sort of collapsing of time because in some instances you haven't been present during the formation of Soviet Armenia, you're also part of a diaspora. And that is in itself is really interesting, interesting how you're sort of creating this social imaginary. Yeah, this is something that you yeah, kind of pick up a lot in the in a conversation, conversation in the book, that this, I am an observer here in this kind of histories. Uh, 
I am not. Uh, I, I don't have the kind of lived experience of the of the realities of uh, of the of the Soviet space. So yes, this is a, this is a kind of uh, a, a point. A point. Yeah. Yeah. It's an important one, and, and if we can kindly, and should we move on kindly, slightly so that we can look at, so we can I, think look at between, I think in between, I create a sort of conversation sort with, of other with other artists' work. So, work. so the work that's so uh, the work behind that's me is by a Georgian by artist, by a Sofia Chabezadeh, which Chabezade, looks at this idea of post-Soviet reality. Post -Soviet reality. And this is a quite interesting and one that deals with a series of facades, although she hasn't, her hand is not part of this. This is an existing sort of work, whereas in the work of Aikaturini, it's more of an inherent possibility of what the artist's hand can sort of interject, in particular the feminist realm. This is, these are a series of uh, buildings that were produced uh, after the fall of communism in Georgia, in Tbilisi. And it's a very, they have a very funny title because they're named after a sort of contemporary proverb, if you like, that says, in a country with flourishing democracy, even the plastic flowers will grow. And these are all uh, very uh, stylized sort of buildings, rem reminiscent of the buildings that were being produced in the post-Soviet post era in Georgia, era. except in they Georgia, all had this sort of very visible sort of plastic uh, flower uh, decor flower that the artist sort of has been exploring within her uh, within practice. Her Although practice. it's really Although important to say really that many of these artists haven't artists had a first-hand experience. First -hand They've been sort of dislocated from their histories or they were not part of the making of the Soviet space. They are sort of producing criticisms, if you like, within this sort of public sphere. Uh, and what is sort of really and important is really in this book is that um, idea, of where, idea of where these fragments of identity come together. Identity come so in some together. cases, there so are some cases, very uh, important sort of figurative uh, examples. Figurative examples. Figurative Others are more relying are on a landscaping where the figure is absent. So you sort of have to imagine. And in this particular series, we jump again back to I. Caturini's work. The series is entitled Falling Tight. And it is really exploring this idea of fragmented bodies, fragmented history, Trees, ideas, ideas, amnesias, recollections, amnesias, sort of coming together as this uh, quite, uh, quite um, uh, um, gapped, rather, gap elements of gaps occurring within these histories. This one is going into the space, so we're entering as a sort of a recreational space. We also have these gymnasts. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about this because it's one of my favorite series of your work. Yeah, this one is, yeah, that's why I said the future will come, because this is like more, more evidently about the kind of, uh, the idea of a bright future with the space race. This, this, I think this work came immediately after a little bit much, a little bit too late, and it's again early example of my class practice. And for this, this work, my way of collecting and dealing with archival material becomes more more crystallized in the sense that I literally bring together diverse image. I call them image histories. Diverse image. Well. Diverse much histories, and here it's very clear that, uh, well, it's not very clear, but I'm telling you that these are, I mean, it's very clear because one, we have the American cape something, which I don't remember the name, where you have the, the rocket, the Carnarvon, yes, this is correct, and the other one is the Soviet. Uh, 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 it's not a missile, it's a Soviet uh, missile, rocket, a Soviet, uh, uh, space uh, rocket. Space so rocket. in this so falling tide, I brought together I the, brought together the very clearly oppositional, very contradictory, contradictory co Cold War co image, Cold histories, War, image of histories of the gymnast and the, and the space the race. Space race. And not in order to comment, in order to I subvert it in the I sense, mm -hmm. this sense. Both, both of these histories, both of these histories uh, and use them uh, in order to talk about order how order talk the about female how body can uh, express uh, uh, pleasure, can, uh, can, pleasure, can, can find pleasure can find outside, pleasure, outside uh, type, uh, binary, uh, binary positions. positions. Um, yeah, uh, I think. And also and in this, also this is, I mean, it's clear here I mean, in this work the affinity, the general affinity with uh, Sarah's uh, way of uh, writing way and of thinking curatorially, in the sense of bringing together 
this juxta uh, uh, heterogeneous juxtaposing fragmented pos positions and material. So I, I call this work ready-made because for me there are not collages, there are decollages. There are, it's almost like I create the space uh, in between these two um, images, um, images uh, while bringing them together. While bringing them together. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of really inherent, the way the book is organized, it's very experimental, you can sort of start at any point in the book. The chapters, you can go in and out, so it's a very uh, fragmented, sort of intentionally uh, decollaging exercise as a writing or a curatorial practice as well which isn't well, the normative one when you're thinking, one thinking one about a retrospective, about a retrospective uh, body of uh, work. Body and of work. could you talk a little and bit about these images as well, because you introduce an element of nature, of nature and there's the other areas of focus other with the mathematical with concept the Yes, well. I, I, yes. I, I introduced, I, I, introduced uh, I think it is a book I on Eisenstein's book uh, theory of relativity, it's again a Soviet book, and I, now it reminds me of something now that has become more, more concrete in my thinking now. I'm interested in, in the language of science as also, also a kind of masculine paradigm. paradigm. And, and the illustrations, and the here, illustrations oh, here, it's oh, obvious it's that by collaging them, I make them something them, completely them different. Something so completely I think different. this I is think again, yeah, a look at different heterogeneous material, bringing them into conversation that um, um, brings out brings um, um, my in my my thinking my, is that thinking while is that while when you while, place them while, together, when you place them together uh, they, uh, they create uh, gaps and then somehow gaps, new things come out new ideas out. these new um, ways of being of ways ways narratives of being emerge. Narratives. Emerged. But um, the, uh, the Soviet gymnast the Soviet gym is this kind of fantastic kind ideal, as fantastic an ideal as the space race, the um, space Russian um, space race, you know, and their prowess in the Russian space race. And uh, it's and, uh, interesting that the gymnasts are all falling, and that the, the, even though the rockets are pointing the upwards, pointing up, there's this wonderful, there's this well, in wonderful, these, the, well, in these, just the fragment of this, series. Of this series, but uh, even the flowers are upside even down. Yeah, it's just like um, it's just like your, um, your um, but um, they're taking out the triumphalism, out the triumphalism deflating it. They're, deflating they're, they're also American they're, gymnasts. They're also American. <laughs> so they are both both of them <laughs> there because, because they were also you know competing. So competing, I I captured so this, this both sides. I yeah, and this I, called for yeah, it's called it's falling tight the the series. But I think for me it's ambiguous if they're falling or not. So because they're caught mid movement, let's say they're caught mid. Movement. There, there, there's a rhizomatic element a here, which is sort of really interesting. But they're suspended, rather. They're suspended. Yeah. It's suspended moments, yeah. so you don't really know what's going to happen, which is really fascinating. And sort of moving on, sort of moving uh, on there's a sort of uh, zigzagging between sort of history, zigzagging different geographies, history, different narratives. Different narratives. But there's something very important something within this book, and I was having a conversation with Katie about this recently as well. She happens to be my PhD supervisor. So about how proximity, so about is, sort of how proximity is sort of very uh, important right now and to reflect right upon contemporary events. And in the case of Iran, which is sort of very much prevalent in the news right now over the last six months, because of this very generationally proven revolution that's occurring, this Human life movement revolution. However, sort of the roots However, of what we're trying to understand really, really lie understand within really the modern lie. period. And a lot uh, that can be sort of revealed about Iran really resides within this particular history. And it's only with proximity that we can sort of really understand uh, the current nature of events, a lot of the art that's being produced in a sort of immediate sense. Often, sometimes it's lacking in a sort of intellectual response. It's sometimes a little bit slapstick. You could argue it's a bit pun, but it does lack a sort of engagement with time and understanding of and where understanding events of where sit, events where they actually reside within actually a larger reside, context, a, larger a context, political context, a, a social context, 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 a gender-based context. Uh, agenda context. These two works are sort of really essential to a chapter uh, within, chapter, within uh, the book that's on the concept of whistleblowing, the concept or the artist as whistleblower, the artist how artists whistleblower, reveal artists certain uh, histories, and often, you know, with sort of ideas around secrecy or certain files, they're often released after a certain amount of time has passed. But often, you know, things are not sort of revealed immediately. And in this particular work, it was sort of really interesting to sort of think through this idea 
and uh, with the work of Mitra Tabrizian, who is a British Iranian filmmaker and artist, uh, photographer, mainly working within the medium of photography and film. These two works, I juxtaposed them for the purpose of a sort of revisionist idea of thinking about Iran. The top image was actually produced in the analog era, although the caption does say it's a digital photograph. It was actually stitched together by hand, because at the time when she produced this photograph, there wasn't the digital sort of technology available. And it's looking at a very decisive moment in Iranian history, though produced in 89, 1990, sort of looking at that modern period to sort of understand all the colluding that took place, all the sort of interference that took place, all the coups and uh, other sort of events that led to the demotion of women, that led to their demotion from the public space to one that was almost rendered invisible, or rather sort of uh, given a cover, if you like, a veiled, if you want. And uh, this and, uh, image itself borrows a lot from the writing the and sort of uh, of Guy de Bord, which is the Society of Spectacle. You have the whole world watching, whole world yet you watching, see these sort of histories on the history, bookends of this image. Of this image. Uh, it's uh, difficult to tell, but the suits of the uh, European-American uh, facing uh, men are their pocket uh, squares are the American and British flag. And British so you flag. see on one hand so the British intelligence the British shaking the hand with the Islamic the clerics, the Islamic mullahs. Clerics, on the other the opposing other side, you see the side, cover of Time magazine of Time with Dr. Mossadegh, who is the Iranian uh, democratically elected uh, prime minister. It's image there. So you see sort of remnants of history, the CIA's involvement in Iran, the coup that led to the absolute monarchy of Reza Shah, who was the monarch at the time, and then you see the center of the image, which is sort of a, a woman who is lying on the ground, her demotion, and the sort of rise, the sort of polarization of the sacred and the profane, and the sort of danger of this, the child bride and the soldier during the Iran-Iraq war. There are a lot of remnants there, and really what we could argue is that we can see what is unfolding in Iran by understanding its modern history. Everything is already present there. Juxtaposing that image Juxtaposing is, that one, image at is bottom, one at the bottom, also by Mitra, also by Mitra entitled, Tehran, entitled Tehran, and it's dated 2006. And, 2006. and this is a, a working is class a working uh, area of Tehran, area of Tehran which, uh, which is which, underdeveloped. Uh, underdeveloped. You sort of see the... Omnipresence, omnipresence of uh, Khomeini, of, uh, Khomeini on the Khomeini billboard, the sort of the rulers, billboard, supreme rulers of Iran, sort of Iran, overbearing sort of presence. Overbearing you see presence, this disorientation of these people as a possible people sort of uh, allegory sort of, for the current, uh, condition. For the current condition. And you have the direction, and obviously, of Mitra. Of Mitra. Photography is a very confrontational very confrontation sort of uh, practice. Sort of it's a very much hand-eye coordinated. It's a very decisive medium and the way it's enacted here. She says that she didn't style or direct these people. They are sort of standing in a way that felt natural to them. But what is really apparent is that they're standing in all different directions. They are directionless or motionless, but at the same time, there is that idea of the promise of this revolution that has led to sort of an unpromise, rather. It was a promise that was never, ever delivered much akin to this much barren land, this which, barren is which is also underdeveloped. So there's a sort of social commentary social happening commentary. here. Time is suspended, time is, suspended. Time is fragmented, time, time is stitched fragmented. together. Is stitched you sort, together. Of you sort of see these various uh, ideas uh, sort of interplaying with one another. It was sort of really important really to reflect. Important. reflect. And as we're sort of reflect. thinking sort about of what's thinking unfolding about in real time in Iran, we start to rethink how this stitching together of time is sort of opening up another avenue to think about uh, space, uh, or, space or a revolutionary or a sort of revolutionary moment that is very much re uh, generationally uh, privy. And I sort of do reflect sort of upon that a little bit in the book. In and I sort of continue, this is a work by uh, Aziza Shadinova, uh, who is a Kyrgyz artist. A Kyrgyz and she's part of this social media generation. She's part of, media generation. Media she's part of the generation, part of what the generation, we would call Generation Z. And who are all sort of coming of age at the moment. These are sort of highly astute when it comes to Twitter, social media, all Forms of, media, forms of technological sort of communication. Sort of communication. So, we've from so we've shifted what was then shifted the from what was then the analog space into the digital space. space. And this generation in particular, this generation which is leading this current revolution, revolution in Iran, is young 
very much privy to a very particular generation, are perhaps using codes and cues that are very, very advanced in a way that my generation and that of my parents was sort of not possible. We were always told to sort of smuggle in our ideas, think of, you know, uh, being a little bit less transparent. But this generation in particular are having to perform in plain sight. They are aware that there is a hyper-surveillance, so you see that idea of the billboard that was in Mitra's work. When we're thinking about this particular generation, they are adopting a, a sort of a reenacting a term called social stenography. And what that really means is that they're having to perform in a very public arena. They are all privy to the codes that they are discussing as a generation. However, we are not so aware of that. This is something, a strategy that is like no other. What is really unfolding in front of us is very much rooted in the language the visual language, the, visual the, language, vernacular, the vernacular, the, not the, just in the speech, but also that what translates into the technological, technological speech, technology, the daily interactions, the, daily the gestures interactions of a generation of that a generation is at the forefront of something the forefront that is revolutionary, that is revolutionary. In, a in a sense that they are that having to do everything to do that is within plain sight. And what I mean by that is that there are certain codes. Historically, we might have seen people wearing certain color shoelaces or certain um, certain, um, uh, other um, sort of codes, uh, and this is sort of codes, expanding into expanding a space, creating a sort of space, space but non-space at the non -space same time that is very, very public, very, very but at the same public, time can be sort of opening up sort of much, opening much, up much, much, much wider, wider discourse. Wider Katie discourse. and I were also talking about the use of sound, the honking of the horns that you can't tell whose car it's coming from, the singing or the shouting out of windows that is also happening, creating a sort of noise bomb, if you like, that creates diversions. So these strategies of rebellion aren't those that were sort of happening, that were very well organized in 1979. People would come together. Even in the Arab Spring, the use of Twitter was very much prevalent, Facebook. But in a country where all of this is disabled, there are new ways in which these young people are having to sort of grapple Although they are using, you know, Tor, using, VPNs, you know, all these sort of VPNs, proxies in order to bypass all these censorships, all these they are having to sort of enact sort of within enact a very public a space public in a language that can only be deciphered be by this very generation, which is sort of really important to point really out that what is happening that now has been unlike any been other unlike sort of revolutionary other shift that has occurred. I think this juxtaposition this of uh, Mitra Tabrizian and this artist is very interesting because the, the um, Mitra Tabrizian's work is very much um, part of this kind of um, attempt to produce attempt digital to produce photography digital which was photography, like history which painting, like history which painting. spoke to history which painting. It's very much in that genre of Jeff Wall and, Jeff you know, the, 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 that similar yeah, the, the, thing. Similar. Can you make a statement make that a statement is universal, universal enough that contains, enough that contains the, history the history and stories of time as it was a very, was very specific very political specific transitional moment? Whereas the other image uh, um, it's gone off the main screen, but the other image is is very much is very much the saturation of images that you find images in social media, absolute social saturation, media, absolute the normative saturation, image. Normative there are millions of people, millions you know, of people photographing you know, themselves photographing with, their themselves with, their with their mobile phones. But what she has done is she's juxtaposed it with a collage of non-space. Non uh, the, there's a non-space of the city behind her. It's all the spaces which has almost no meaning, but you know, you recognize them, you know, of local areas of, you know, neglected parts of the city, of logos that don't quite work or, don't quite you know, work, sort of, you know, motorways, motorways, opens, you know, opens, very ill thought you know, through entrances of apartment blocks, park benches, you know, they're very non-spaces. Yes. Non and yes. that juxtaposition is quite interesting because it situates them in a city, you know, in a, in a different way. In a, in a different way. Very, very, very different the way that I continue from where, how the female body is placed within this. The space, the space, which is my interest. Trabizan's work is very much kind of, uh, kind of uh, space that, uh, uh, located very specifically in the space of the city. Here, it's, it's, it's we are not sure if it's located in the space of the city because it's 
also need a bit suspended in a sense. Absolutely. They are Absolutely. in the city, they but in the city, their but spaces are sort of threshold spaces because they go between the public and the private space. And the private so, space. But then again, so, the but cues then again, that they are performing, because they're performing for themselves. It's really sort of important really to say that this generation, generation in particular is performing first and foremost for itself. It's sort of not necessarily interested in earlier generations or the way they went about doing things. Their, their being is very much rooted in the now and within their generation, the sort of generation that maybe it had a promise that we have perhaps let down a little bit as well. And sort of that's sort of really crucial to say. And then spaces of threshold, spaces of sort of post-devastation, there's a lot of reflection or sort of revisionist sort of ideas. ideas. And in the work ideas. of Lida Abdul, of Lida uh, she's an artist also uh, that I've been working with, been probably working one of the longest running artists longest I've been working with since 2003, who's an Afghan artist. An and Afghan and artist. She, returned she returned to Afghanistan to after the Afghanistan toppling after of the, the Taliban. As a young Taliban, child, she was forced to flee Afghanistan after the Soviet invasion. And she spent many years stateless, living in Germany, in India, before going on to the United States. And she was from an upper middle class family. Her, both her parents had studied in Germany uh, prior during uh, the 60s. And, um, and um, her father wrote law father for wrote Afghanistan. Law. Their life was sort of uh, heavily interrupted heavily after this interrupted event. After this and event. she returned to Afghanistan returned to witness to two things in abundance uh, after 2002. Uh, after and those were ruins and, and graves. So there is this idea so of a purification, idea of, of, space, purification of space and sort of also and thinking sort of about the sort of destruction of, the civil spaces, of civil spaces, destruction of architecture, destruction in, particular. Of architecture in particular. And with the events that are sort of happening, the these are all sort of, sort of things, things that we are discussing, ideas rather, ideas rather that we are discussing this evening that are in retrospect. Some of these works are dated 2004, 2005. We're thinking about them from a revisionist angle. This particular work deals with the sort of destruction of the Buddhas of Bamiya which, Bamba, as I was earlier saying, had the same sort of time period as the destruction of 9-11. And sort of the histories and tend sort of to intersect, and they're not very pleasant, they're, they're, they're very pleasant, complicated, they're but they sort of reveal a, a certain hand. So what we're sort of trying to say through these ideas, that how can the artist's hand be considered a hand of repair? How can it be considered a hand of repatriation in particular, and how these sort of two very different ideas could sort of come together in a poetic way? Because really, there is a time to be didactic, like a blunt hammer on the wall, and there's a time to be offer another kind of language, one that's slightly ambiguous, one that sort of goes against, or rather, is contradictory at the same time as well. And within Leader's work, there is a strong reference to the destruction of Afghanistan, the destruction of civil society, but also a lot of ideas related to hope. In these particular works, I mean, she was never able to ever include women. There are always children or always men, children because, or women men were, because women were, were not feeling, were you know, they were, feeling, when she approached you know, women to be part of her work, they never felt comfortable. They were, comfortable. They were always sort of marginalized from central space, yet women held a very important role. Uh, culturally, uh, culturally uh, linguistically, uh, linguistically uh, historically uh, within this region. Within but this region. now, given the sort of situation that's occurring, that's occurring they've been again and again marginalized, and again marginalized put, marginalized, put to the periphery, put to but then, the periphery, forcing, then themselves forcing themselves back within the center. Within Many the of the center. tropes within Many leaders' work borrow, borrow from Iranian from cinema, Iranian in which cinema, children were used um, as, an um, as an example to speak about tales of morality. So sort of moral questioning, moral ideas were sort of performed through the, the character of children that was sort of really, of really important, decisive really action decisive in new action wave cinema. New wave and here cinema. she sort of reprises she their, role their role as a sort of a spokesperson, a sort of again, a spokesperson. generationally again, previous, sort of really important to think really through uh, the generation uh, that is coming. Again, coming up again, again that are sort of again, able, to able to deal with trauma in a way that perhaps way their that parents perhaps and their earlier parents generations are unable to do so. They're able to sort of create so. surreal they're elements, they're able to bypass ideas, bypass and at the same ideas. time put at themselves the time, at the themselves forefront of something, the forefront where of something where their lives are also their could be in jeopardy, and they have been jeopardized. You know, there have been executions and deaths and all kinds of terrible atrocities performed on them. And within sort of, we're moving now 
now to another We're geography to think to about, uh, about uh, Turkey, uh, in particular Turkey, after the Gezi particular Park riots. Gezi Some of you, park park riots. you may remember that they actually they happened in 2013, in which uh, what started which off as a very peaceful protest very peaceful quickly protest, escalated quickly into a standoff with the police and also the National Guard was sent to correct space. And this is also a time when journalism Journalism was sort of really, really cracked down really against. You know, journalists were sort of against, you know, interrupted. interrupted. They were arrested. They were it became arrested. part of a sort of very dystopian reality, one that uh, had a very that, ugly sort of reality associated with it. In the work of Inji Evener, she reflects upon delinquent women, or sort of the kind of women, earlier on I mentioned this sort of dichotomy that existed in social space of being sacred and profane, and how women are sort of always allegorized in many ways with Within this sort of dialogue, and here there are these delinquent women that have to be corrected within the series or the, within this filmic project. And it's rather interesting here, she also opens up a larger dialogue around femme, sort of other queer space as well, that uh, adds another dimension into the, how we think about feminist spaces as well, which is sort of really important. And leading on from that, the same artist's work, Inji Evener, this is a film produced uh, slightly earlier to Runaway Girls uh, in 2009, uh, 2009, which is taken, which is taken from a drawing that was produced um, in the 19th, um, in the 19th century, by century by Austrian uh, artist uh, who visited an Ottoman visited court, an Ottoman the harem, harem of Sultan Salem. And, and when he visited there, he created a, a, drawing, created a, that a drawing that looked like an institution. It was a sort of very orientalist imagination of what he imagined the East to be. So she sort of subverts that original drawing and creates a whole animated filmic experience experience with experience characters with that are engaged characters within their own rebellious, their own subversive, rebellious subversive acts. Act. Some of them uh, are cleaning, uh, cleaning somebody uh, sweeping the floor with somebody's the hair. They're engaged in all hair, kinds of uh, rebellious, uh, subversive, non-conformist non activities that sort of go against sort of go these against ideas that these are ideas within the categorical within frame, the of frame of an institution. And obviously one could argue that any of these sort of spaces that are attached to the state are basically an extension of state apparatus, this extension of this imagination that is sort of rooted in the Orientalist idea, which was sort of really important to sort of fleet through these ideas throughout the book. So they are sort of present uh, throughout. So it's a sort of um, narrative thread that continues within every chapter. It's quite a strong um, element of the book that there are an awful lot of artists who are offering critiques of Orientalism from from the countries from the which they, countries uh, which they Orientalism, uh, is Orientalism is supposedly looking towards. And I think this kind of attempt to tell a different story, tell a different story uh, from, a uh, from a local perspective, but also like punning, also like punning, punning uh, sort punning, of like uh, uh, critiquing sort of like or critiquing joking or about or joking uh, the fantasies uh, the generated fantasies about them, generated like the Ottoman po like uh, the postcards po or the harem like this one, or or, like one, I mean, another artist like Gulsum Karama stuff has yes. done many yes. kind of tiles of kind of, tiles, kind of joking about kind of Ottoman joking baths about Ottoman and, baths you know, the, and, the you fantasy know, the, of the baths the fantasy in of the, the harem. Mm -hmm. And if I may add, Inji's also, also the generation that uh, witnessed that the coup that happened in the 80s in, in the 80s Turkey, in which Turkey, many of her friends, students at the time, were arrested, they were disappeared. And this was all happening in the wake of the Iranian Revolution of 79. It was happening in the early 80s. And that they just vanished. So there was also a fear that that same sort of socialist ideology would, would sort of sweep through into Turkey as well. And um, so it was also a moment of a kind of student led sort of uh, revolution, which is sort of again generationally privy to younger people, younger generation. But in Inji's case, it was uh, she must have been about 19, 20 at the time when this coup happened, and in which several of her friends were murdered. Sadly, and they, they were disappeared. They were never, we never know never, never what happened know to them. Again, to them. Again, coming from a sort of institutional, sort body, of but institutional body, but also creating this dialogue creating about how dialogue several about things how can sort of coexist at the same time. They were sort of resisting, yet they were part of the state-sponsored education at the same time. And if I, and if I mm. may come back to this, to the back punk back orientalism, orientalism, for me as an artist for working with Sarah, this is a really important point because I think 
the whole book and the, her way of working um, is, for me, is, is, is precious because it places the work within a different framework, uh, within, in association and in relationship with histories that are relevant and coexistent rather than continuously uh, looking back uh, into a Western canon. A Western and canon. for me, that, 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 as an artist, that, that, this is a very important, very important uh, way to uh, way acknowledge to where my work where my sits work and sits where its kind of ambition maybe lies, or which are the kind or of um, dialogues that I am uh, attempting uh, to visualize. I'm not sure if I made myself clear. Yeah. Very, very clear. And uh, I also appreciate the fact that it's East-East, you know, and uh, the comparisons are East-East, because those comparisons are really lost in what we have all suffer from, which is nationalist histories, and particularly nationalist histories of art, where it's basically a selection and inclusion of the greatest Turkish artists, the greatest Kazakhstan artists, the greatest Afghan artists. You know, it's just like a... It's like a linear approach and so you can't look across different spaces simultaneously and I and I think it's really valuable that these histories are really present in the book all these kind of events that you have been talking about because then we are not uh, uh, thinking of the vernacular or traditional or the cultural specific element of uh, each of these works in relationship to how they enter the modern, but you are seeing them as part of this kind of specific constellations of continuous changing power dynamics. And it's that idea of oscillation that I mentioned earlier, that is going back and forth. And it's really important to sort of shift that history away from East-West in order to create these new sort of understandings of histories. And looking at East-East dialogues, I mean, two-thirds of the world never looked to North America and Europe to define themselves. They did look to the Soviet Union. That included Africa, that included Latin America, parts of the Indian subcontinent continent that was sort of really interested in a new paradigm of thinking within the post-colonial uh, world. And that was really important to sort of think through now for me to think of the post-Soviet and the, and the post-colonial in tandem, because this is also another moment that's been sort of missed. Although it sometimes sort of enters uh, a discourse, but it's sort of not enough research being entered in this area and sort of the investment isn't really as present there as it should be. When we think about African socialism, like I spent Christmas in Uzbekistan, there were so many African scholars and historians who studied in Uzbekistan, yet there's a complete miss of that history or that opportunity. Or, for example, a family friend of ours who was happened to be uh, Afghan, who was um, the director of the Bauhaus, was actually a specialist of Latin American architecture. So it shouldn't always have to be, but the same Time, something I do want to point out. Thinking of Eastis isn't always bliss. Sometimes there are very nefarious histories that go under the radar when we tend to center West and East as well. And those include the sort of ideas around civil wars, the kind of, the, through the rise of nationalism, the kind of neighboring tensions that are occurring that are equally as they are interesting in terms of intellectual exchange, are also can be very dangerous and very complex at the same time. But most of the artists that you're dealing with or you selected, like your 31 artists, they're not, they're, they're creating anti-nationalist stories. They're not, um, again, the, just as much as they're punning Orientalism, they're also punning the uh, morality of Turkish state. And uh, um, so there are other connections going on there. Absolutely. They're sort of not the state spot. Some of the artists are, but others are, haven't. Uh, they're not biting the hand that feeds them, the that feeds them per se, not completely, se, let's not just say they leave a few okay, fingers, okay, you know, they don't okay, bite it all off, you know, but there is a little bit there of there a sort of idea of around this, but what was really interesting, like, somebody really asked a question about, about how, how uh, in Central Asia and Caucasus uh, and, Central and Asia, Iran, how and Iran, uh, local how people feel local about this, whether there's any scene or any support, and I mentioned, they said that we looked at the captions in the book, and it says courtesy of the artist, it doesn't offer much idea that they're courtesy of a gallery or 
the infrastructure. And I said, well, that should answer your question. That they're very much independent. They're part of a sort of scene that's creating dialogue bottom up. Bottom up. So artists are taking so on peer are taking on roles peer where they are gallerists, they are gallerists uh, mentors, uh, mentors, mentees, all, mentees, within, the all within the same frame. frame. They take on multiple roles, and that's sort of really interesting as well. Really interesting um, well. I mean, you could also argue I mean, could that most of the artists are part of very big Biennale, very big circuits, Biennale circuits, circuits, and this new internationalism this new in the Biennales that is a phenomenon of the 2000s, they have also benefited they've from. Also they've also found uh, also ways to get their work from a local scene from a local into an international, into an international uh, arena. Uh, arena. But the, the, the problem has often problem been has that often there has been an Orientalism been by a lot of European, European, European curators <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to um, position them position as others, them others. As others you there know, is that. And, and there's yeah. a kind of like, and, and um, kind of like you know, um, these will be our you know, representatives, representatives of this, of this particular country. This we'll pick this country. one from Uzbek. We'll pick this one from Kazakhstan. And we will put them together in this new internationalism. Well, some artists play that game and others do it very well. And some choose to completely disengage from that as well. And I think that that's a market conversation, market versus, you know, critical sort of space conversation. Of course, Venice or other biennials give great exposure to artists that they would ordinarily never have. But then there's also about the sort of uh, sustainability or the investment in the artists, which means creating a scene for them, uh, writing about them, nurturing them as well. And that sort of also must go hand in hand. Yeah. But I'm not just talking about yeah, the big biennales of Venice and, and Sao Paulo. Venice I'm also thinking of Baku or, yes. or, you know, Guangzhou um, yes. or, you know, um, Johannesburg Biennale. I mean, there are many other biennales where the same biennals group of artists are touring, given opportunities. You know, this, the, you know, this, you know, the Biennale circuit the has been circuit quite has been influential, influential in opening up the possibilities up for the thinking about internationalism about differently. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. No, no, I agree with that no, point no, also, but point this is also, also shifting in terms, also of in terms of generational. Sort of now there is a rising so of a younger generation because more assessment, more, more assessment, uh, care uh, is going uh, into uh, how these uh, uh, events are being orchestrated, which is great. I think we should open it. I think yes. it um, should we open it up for questions, or you want to show some more? And you have many more oh, images. Oh, oh, just a few. Maybe we could show a little bit more. Yes. Yes. I, if you, I if you can get, bear with I, me, I audience, keep your questions and okay. then we'll open it. Why, uh, coming back, fleeting back, I have one very important one very reference important to architecture reference within the presentation today. Is the role of uh, Faradiva, uh, who was the queen Faradiva, of Iran, queen of under, Iran. Um, under, during the 60s and the 70s. The 60s her position as a trained architect a trained was a little bit more uh, as an architect uh, of a nation. She was in charge with the entire cultural infrastructure of Iran. And these are images by the only man in the presentation, Farhad Irania, who's actually unfortunately not here. And these are entitled The Body of Her Spirit, in which it wouldn't be a book about punk if there wasn't a monarchic figure. And this one happens to be from the East, happens to be from Iran. But in her sort of, um, in his sort of uh, deconstruction of her identity, of her figure, was really to place her at the center of what was then a cultural revolution in Iran. And by that, I mean, we talk about the um, um, Havana Biennial, the Sao Paulo Biennial, the Shiraz the festivals in the 60s and, and 70s and of Iran were the first Iran example of an international art, art festival were then festival sort of transpired then into Biennial so and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and in which international and artists were invited to Iran to perform to Iran and to take part in events against the ruins of Persepolis in Shiraz. Shiraz. That was the backdrop. There was no was museum at that stage. No you had an open-air museum open concept, air which was sort of fascinating, concept, fascinating, fascinating in itself because you had these sort of historical relics, historical relics and then you had relics, people like Stockhausen, like Merce Cunningham coming to Iran and creating this sort of visual cultural sort of history there. And she was sort of very, very important figure at that time who time. had a who quiet, had a quiet revolutionary, spirit. revolutionary spirit. Obviously, given her position, given her position as the wife of the, the Shah, she couldn't really Shah, ever be really fully sort of a, fully a very aggressive in her approach. But there was a very quiet, 
rebellion about her and the kind of way in which she was using culture to mobilize the masses and way in which she was sort of doing it in a very sophisticated way and a very interesting although she could never prevent a revolution she could, she had a very socialist spirit and though she was able to sort of smuggle in ideas and that's something in the book as well it's sort of a, a poetic code a conceptual contraband if you like that I sort of uh, um, bind through out the book because I'm always very interested in sort of a freeing of smuggling and contraband from its illicit connotations and thinking through how figures would use their position. And she was a fantastic example of that in what was happening in Iran. And sort of you see here uh, an image that sort of depicts this, uh, this is called Stage on Fire, that sort of shows these um, uh, figures, these dancers, it's a sort of correlation with your work uh, against these ruins and the sort of fantastical sort of histories that are looking at Within, within, the within the formation of Iran. Of Although you had Iran, pointed out that these were sort of taken from Kandinsky, these, these are sort of the Orientalist the tropes Orientalist that were then taken on by Western modern artists. And modern there has been sort of research a little bit into that, but it's always the sort of reverse. And I wanted to sort of include this in the presentation today to talk a little bit about her figure and this idea of architects of nation and what that really sort of means in a sense that that cultural sort of architecture architectural element or engineering rather and how that can sort of subvert public space. And sort of also to conclude on this idea of satire, you keep mentioning there's an artistic license that creatives have that often creatives to be satirical about histories. About these, histories. Are, um, these are, this um, is actually take, these images are from a film called The Fast and the Furious the by Taos Makacheva. She's the artist on the cover, She's standing the on the camel. Cover, on the camel. Uh, super Taos is uh, her super alter, her alter ego. ego. And under the guise and of Super Taos, she enacts various performances in Dagestan. In Dagestan, is actually used to be part of Persia. Persian Empire was one of the few Soviet possessions that was, uh, never, ever that was never ever granted, granted its independence. Dagestan still independence. remains part or officially of Russia. Or officially of Russia. And in this and performance, in this as Super Towers, she goes Super undercover as part of a, um, a um, to infiltrate a to car infiltrate racing. A car sort of space. This illegal sort of space. car racing illegal happens in Dagestan, happens in the capital. In Dagestan, in the capital. Uh, it's a very hyper-masculine uh, performance, performance in which she sort of goes undercover in this car. It's entirely car. covered by fur. Covered and fur, fur is the fur commodity is what the later commodity cotton, what later grain, cotton, gas, gas became. Gas it was became. the commodity that fueled the, the Russian Empire, the Russian all the way from Siberia way to Alaska. And it has a really sort of funny connotation really sort of funny around it. Connotation She's around driving it. this car. Driving nobody nobody realises it's a woman behind it. It's the car is entirely it's covered by fur, fur, which was once this sort of very regal sort of object, this highly sort of sought after commodity sort of sort of sort of that now you can buy in a flea market for like two pounds or something. These old coats. So then she covers the entire car, and there's a sort of fascination there. So satire was a sort of really important strategy, as equally was smuggling, as equally were more of the more um, strategic criticisms of state and public space, but this was a really uh, a sort of interesting one to end the presentation on this evening. So now I can open it up to anyone who has questions. Questions? Yes, at the back. Yes. Um, artists, the, the role artist union plays in in ex-Soviet countries. Ex countries. There, uh, today I didn't because there was a very today particular project in the book. It's actually in the centerfold of the book that is based on friendship of the peoples. And it's more rooted in film history or the cinema clubs that were sort of established as well, not just in the Soviet Union, but by proxy in the Arab world. So it sort of, again, starts to explore that idea. But of course, there was union. At the same time, there was a... Uh, uh, today, artist unions artists still play play still a big play role a big role in ex-Soviet countries. They so do. Like Mongolia, like Azerbaijan, etc. Et Some, there are sort of artist Some, unions, artists but they're very unions, much, they're the, very the kind much of art that's being produced with them, within their frames, is very, let's say it's not as cutting edge, it's a little bit of the sort of focus on what the Soviets established. Most of the more renegade spaces are sort of being run, established by more contemporary generation artists, sort of, Learning about, learning uh, about through the back door uh, on Western art history. There's Western a little bit of touching on that in the book, but not so much. Uh, 
Can you give examples of these spaces? These yes, spaces? so uh, most yeah, of the so, spaces uh, that exist, the spaces they're sort of, that exist, uh, they're sort of uh, uh, mostly it's uh, artists uh, who've taken on these roles. So they've established art spaces in Baku, in Tashkent. First, they started out of studios. Studios then expanded to residencies. Residencies then became art spaces. So sort of there was this very interesting trajectory happening that sort of everything was born in the sort of studio space, which were, one could argue, social studios. They were sort of very uh, not very, just a solitary not space not where solitary artists were working, artists but they were opening them up opening to, them public, up to uh, public, their fellow colleagues, uh, fellow, fellow artists, but fellow also, artists, to, but general also to general because public. Because really the sort of, uh, really the, the, sort of uh, the state the, the driven sort of art historical art narratives historical weren't narratives really in favor really of in what favor was being produced by the artists who were critical at that time. There were two narrative strands, current. Post-Soviet time, which Post is what the book time, covers. When I visited these places, I didn't uh, get that sense. You didn't get that sense? You didn't get that sense? No. I, did, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't. I wasn't aware or brought attention to these alternative spaces or all these areas where the contemporary was supposed to be superseding more conventional, more conventional um, practices. Well, there were those spaces, there but often they're a little bit renegade, because, because renegade. in the book I also in touch the upon the sort of idea of sort of censorship idea of that, censorship. that <coughs> was occurring. So <coughs> during the Soviet Union, it was Soviet forbidden, Union, it was for forbidden, example, to somebody to work from their home. From so their studio home. spaces so were studio very, very tiny. Very it was only tiny. after the fall only after of the Soviet the Union uh, that spaces uh, became sort of available to artists to take on, because people generally went to work for the state. They worked for the factory, and obviously you had professional professional workers too, but the majority of people went to work in a factory. So there was no idea of working uh, as, you know, how we understand the way studios are sort of formed. This is very new phenomenon for them, but there were underground always conversations happening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the Thank discussion. It was, it was very interesting. I have a question for you, Sarah. When you, you, I want to go back to the artist called Aziza Sadenova, and I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Aziza Sadenova, you did perfect. Perfect, amazing. And the series Girls of Kyrgyzstan, during which you said that you mentioned that the younger generations perform primarily for the for themselves, and I want to return to this they statement a bit and ask you to elaborate on that because I also googled also Aziza googled and she's my generation. Aziza. So not Gen Z, so millennial, but I mean, I, these girls I mean, a little bit I, younger than her. Okay, and yes. I assume that you, okay, you, assume talk, that you broadly. talk broadly. Um, um, and yes, um, I, and yes, this statement um, I, sounds a bit optimistic to me because I think that, because especially that for generations especially like for ours, generations ours and like younger ours than ours, ours and younger the, than relationship the relationship between self, between the performance of self, and the image of self is very complicated and dense and tense. Dense and tense. So, yes, this, um, so yes, this um, idea of performing primarily for ourselves sounds to me a bit optimistic. So yes, I wanted to ask you how you think about it. That's a very good question. They're not just performing for themselves, they're also fully aware that they're being surveyed. So often this group of people have to keep their social media open. They have to make sure their parents have to see it, otherwise they won't allow them to have social media unless they have burner accounts that their parents don't know about. But not ordinarily they have to have passwords that are that their family members, their parents and other peers who are guardian or parent-like can access. So therefore the language that they're creating, they are aware that they're being watched. The, the same way in which way there is no there is private no anymore. Private and we all know that, right? Even though something that, can right? be private, it can be easily private, bypassed. Be easily so there is that idea, so not a big brother, idea, but there is a surveillance brother, that could take many different forms, whether it's the state, forms, whether it's state, one's guardian, or different sort of a set of eyes, if you like, are watching them. 
So therefore, so therefore, to you and I, to the, naked I, I the naked eye, it just looks like a group of young people like doing young whatever young people do. You know, they're sitting in the school you know, setting, they're, they're at home, they're in their bedroom. But there is a communication, there is a communication happening which is very generationally privy very generationally that we might not necessarily be aware of. Be because aware of. having to because move through this private public space, but also a space that's local, global, and digital, so it's further complex, if you like, there's another layer that's attached to it, it's forcing to it. them to create these new, forms, create of these new forms of language. If you think about it, already, already the, lang uh, the verbal language, language I'm talking, language and textual, the language, textual language of text is already text very, very shorthand very that they, shorthand you, know, often, you know, often, I mean, I'm a parent, so I know that there are certain terms and of a teenager, so I'm aware fully that there are certain visual cues, but also linguistic cues that I'm not aware of. They are very much rooted within a generation. Whether or not Whether we're able to decipher them, we can learn them as adults or another generation. But they are, my point was that what they are doing is actually performing not just for themselves, but also fully aware that they're being surveyed. Therefore, they are creating new forms, like the, the way in which we talked also about the uh, sort of genius of the song, uh, Baraya, which means for you, and uh, the idea of the song that won the Grammy, the social activist song by the Iranian uh, singer uh, uh, Shervin Hajipur in Iran, just took from tweets. It was a montage technique. A he took from various technique. tweets, people asking for people clean asking air, people asking for people Afghan asking children to have Afghan rights, you know, women, rights, you so know, forth, women, everything, so but forth, but everything, under the sort of umbrella of woman life, life movement. Of woman life but movement. already these but things existed in public. Existed the way they were public. stitched together were stitched and together produced together created an entirely created new language. So that's what's sort of really so happening, happening really within this work. But it's happening at such a such a level because they're fully aware that people are watching them. You can talk to me later. You can Thank you. Thank you. Please. Please. Oh, God, sorry. Please wait for the mic. Sir. Please wait for the mic. No, they can't uh, they, record it. They can't record it. I think that you wanted to summarize that, wanted that to summarize these ladies were using their own, using their own reflection and their own image and their own to portray a message. Portray I think that that's probably that that's what they were doing. They so were it's doing. not to so themselves, from, from themselves to themselves, from but themselves to themselves. using their own, using their own um, selves um, to, um, to, to pass on the message to the rest. That's, that's probably what uh, that's yes. you wanted to say. Yes. Absolutely. And you know, with TikTok, with, TikTok, other, forms with media, other forms of social media, which are very media, much generationally privy as well, they're privy, rooted in they're young, much younger, younger um, um, Teens use that, teens even younger than that, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds also sort of partake in that, partake that they're also that, aware of what's happening in the wider world. The and a lot of the angst that's generationally, that's generationally privy as well, that we've, well that we've sort of witnessed is, uh, in, is, uh, the uh, in the last year or so, year is, also is also being fueled by this. You know, there's a lot of translation you know, lot of and transliteration happening because of social media. and. And it's interesting, you know, and for example, think about the Me example, Too movement. That started off as a, that was more adult women, but then women. became a sort of wider social phenomena social in the same phenomena. way in which the these people, they're not using necessarily they're hashtag, using necessarily hashtag. There, are there are other cues that would take a long time to decipher these codes. And again, generationally and again, privy. Generationally privy. Um, hello. Um, hello. There's, yes. a lady. There's a lady. <laughs> um, you talked about including talked children about including into children artwork, into which artwork. I think is a really I strong, a really strong uh, uh, yeah, position to take. Position but uh, to do, take. You uh, do you see a connection in pushing, pushing women or limiting women, women, women to the realm of motherhood? Realm of motherhood? And how does that how like does connect that to, the like urban space? to the urban space? Um, uh, uh, sorry, I don't quite follow. Uh, sorry, the use of children and motherhood? Yeah, I mean... For I example, mean, playgrounds or, or okay. Or, um, okay. How is that? Um, how no, is that sure, shown no, in sure, urban shown spaces, in urban like spaces, our like playgrounds in the center of the city. The like the I see them as not really part of the urban social life and 
my question is my if question you see is, that if you see that as a connection to you like, connection to you, like women, only women only being mothers and not being able to not being able to uh, I said uh, women said, were only mothers. No, no, I'm no, not. No, this no, is no, no, no. quite the opposite, <laughs> quite if anything. The, uh, all the works that have been uh, shown have been showing have been women's showing perspectives, perspectives and viewpoints on the world and how diverse they are and how they are not uh, conforming to conforming any one image of what image women should be or do. And that, you know, there are no limits in that sense. Even in, even in these works of imagination, people are really trying to break all those limits, you know, and break all those stereotypes and break all those myths. Um, actually, I think, if anything, um, the artists in punk orientalism, apart from the ones which are orientalist photographs who assembled of, you know, women as... Uh, under the, uh, under in, the in those postcards, in, in apart from that work, who I can't remember who that is. Uh, Ingie Evaner. Yeah, Ingie yes. Evaner's postcards. There are uh, the objectification of women is absolutely defeated by the thirty-one artists in this book. No, totally. Like, I think you understood my question wrong. Did maybe. you Did you want to talk about playground space within these <laughs> cities or that? And um, well, yeah, sorry, I, I don't quite follow the. What's your line of inquiry well, is? I think maybe there are a lot of people who still don't see women as having multiple possibilities. So, like I think they turn the space into a playground a little bit. You yeah, know, yeah, exactly. And they're sort of uh, through this we, imagination. I know. We we yeah. we did talk about this whether we really should emphasize the, you know, whether we should get um, Sarah to emphasize the public private spaces. Because, you know, architecture is full of this absolute division between private space and public space. But I think a lot of the artists in this book have disrupted both. So the last image, there is no private space. It's a public space. Social media has created a public space out of what's seemingly private <coughs> uh, realm. But if you also look at those images, they're like, um, although they might be in the home, in the bedroom, Right? They're not family photographs. They are curated by the girls for other girls. You know, they're, they're, the, the actual um, purpose of those images falls in between all possible genres as we currently understand them. And this whole gap between public and private space is also dissolved by Taus's piece at the end. You know, where is the public and private in that piece? You know, it's... Um, disrupting an uh, all-male genre of motor car racing, you know, with the feminine fur. But then the feminine fur is not a feminine fur. It's a, it's a joke about actual commerce, you know. So it's, it's uh, I see all these um, public-privates completely disrupted by the selection of artists. Perhaps and that's not if you generous to you know, the, richness, the richness of the work. And the idea of the non-collage creating another space of the imagination. My my reading of your comment was the the artist who used couldn't couldn't include women, so but had photographs of men and children, and the mention you made that in, in certain work, yes. yeah, and in certain films, children are used to um, suggest things that can't be spoken about. So I, th I actually, th I read your comment as the success of the work today and, and having the artist here to make a space for thinking about the way that certain provision, you know, um, either marks presence or absence in the city. So I think it, like, you know, when somebody makes a comment that doesn't exactly fit as a response to the work, that's the success of the work, that it generates the imagination. So that's, so that's that was one my way, reading yes. of your response. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's one way of thinking about it. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions for Sarah, for Ekaterina? I just want to follow up on the comments on technology and how maybe Gen Z and millennials try to use technology to communicate with each other that might be a different way of communicating to 
older, from older generations, and I'm wondering if, maybe I'm being too negative, but if giving the older generations the power to understand what our generation is trying to bring about, isn't that not a danger, in some sense, to the continuation of the project that they're trying to achieve? Uh, I can answer you that. No, you answer it. Uh, I think that I believe in dialogue, and my class practice is all about dialogue, so I don't think we ever exist and can function without uh, coming together with other people. So in that sense, we should be able to communicate. Thank you. There's also intergenerational dialogues, right? That's something else to sort of think through. Like, when we're thinking about technology, I didn't have the internet till I was, what, 16, 17 years old. It's very different to somebody who's born with it. Yeah, so it's completely sort of different. You know, of course I've learned it, but it came at, at, to me as a, almost an adult. I was almost 18 at that point. So it's very different understanding to somebody who is born with it, basically, or as a very young child, they're aware of it. Hi. Um, my question was, if the, um, the colleges, the collages, which are the falling tight series and they're a little bit too much, a little bit too late, would you say they have one specific message and like one, you're trying to say something in particular or, or are they um, more of an observation of the shift to the post-Soviet times? Um, no, the, the, they are layered works. Uh, maybe a little bit too much, a little bit too late is more of a comment of on what will you say East East, more of a comment on the transition, making visible this transition that something has changed in the in uh, Armenia. So making visible this what was at the time at the post-Soviet space. But at the same time, there's a la la and I think we kind of talked about it. There's a kind of layer move layering movement between the city, the urban space, the natural world, uh, in relationship to memorializing, in relationship to bringing the inorganic into the organic. So there is a lot of different layers. So the work ca cannot only be read as uh, can be read without its historical context. So we, you, you can read it aesthetically, I suppose, in a, in a, in a sense, as a kind of, uh, like, particular this one. Uh, in Falling Tide, it's about, uh, again, it's a layers of many contradictory ideas. So it's, it's the contradictory image histories that then become this space where women can express themselves. They can express themselves in this work because this kind of contradict, because I, I, I bring this kind of contradictory imagery together uh, and subvert it. So. Yes, good. Are there any other questions? One over here. How do you go about finding the images for your work? Is it the images that inspires your, the concept behind uh, or the other way around? <laughs> this is a good question. This is very elaborate process. So for both of these works, I collected images for like four or five years. So I, different projects and these earlier projects, I collected only images from uh, what I call the public domain, so things that I would find in flea markets, at second-hand bookshops, uh, things that circulated in houses and then they were kind of brought out to be sold, not in the official archive. So there are things that existed in people's houses, uh, all these books, the coffee table books, the books that they had in their libraries, and then they become obsolete and they are somehow uh, left in the flea market, sold in the flea market. And I... I became almost like a type of archivist librarian. So I, for the Soviet Armenian catalogs, I discovered all the different type of public, uh, publishing houses, the system of production, because there was a very specific system of production of imagery. Like the, there was a central, central kind of format for producing this 
books, and then each republic had its own production machine, uh, production, local productions. So I, I had discovered all these uh, production, uh, public houses and types of production, and then I went out and tried to find all of them. So it was, it's a kind of, uh, I call them now incomplete archives, but it, it was, it comes out of a, tri a, a trial to kind to become familiar with this image history in its totality, or it's in its totality that is visible to, in, in the public space. So if there are no more burning questions, I hope that this conversation has excited your interest sufficiently in the book that you will now proceed to purchase one or read <laughs> one and uh, borrow it and actually absorb some of the richness and diversity within it and start to think about the complex uh, collision between punk and Orientalism. So thank you very thank much you. for coming. Thank you.